Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was well past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, and descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. This is the word of the Lord. Those that may not have been here, my name's Tony Jenner. I'm related to Jonathan and live in Darwin and was planning to speak at your camp this weekend, um, but COVID happened, so it didn't happen. But hopefully that can happen in the future. Uh, be loved, be, be, would have been great to be with you. I think, I don't know about you, I don't know what you find hard in the Christian life, but I think the hardest thing in the Christian life is perseverance. Uh, it's keeping going. It's to keep trusting Jesus and his word and living for that. I feel like the longer I live, the more people, sadly, I see give up on Jesus. Uh, I think of childhood friends, uh, kids from youth group, members of my family, even at least three people from my year at Bible college. Um, for some of them, it's, in, it's intellectual objections. Uh, for others, it's moral failures. Uh, for others, just following Jesus, it just becomes too much. What about you? Are you tempted to give up on Jesus? Now, this all might sound pretty negative, um, I'm, I imagine for some of you, life is great. I remember my nana, every Sunday at church, used to say to the minister, uh, isn't it great to be a Christian? And that might be you. But I also think for many of us, the temptation is real because it's hard. The Christian life is hard. It's a battle. Uh, we battle the world around us. We battle our sinful nature within the and the devil whose goal is to cause us to fail. And, and the pressure is great. And we're not alone. Christians throughout the centuries have shared this struggle. And the Christians in the first century who the writer, to the, to the, the writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to also shared this struggle that they too wanted to give up. They were going through, the, these Christians were going through severe trials and persecution and particularly because they are Christians and not Jews, and they're being tempted to give up on Jesus and go back to Judaism where it was going to be easier. And so they've been starting to ask the question, is it worth following Jesus? Is it worth the pain? And now, though our circumstances might be somewhat different to theirs, we still have this same temptation. Is it worth the cost? the pain, the struggle to keep following Jesus. I remember giving this talk at my church in, in Darwin and a lady came up to me afterwards and said, I, I was too negative, she said. It was, she said, I, it was very unedifying and I felt obligated to tell you. Well, I felt obligated to do something unedifying to her, but I didn't. Uh, and I can understand what she's saying. 
But the writer of the Hebrews uh, is actually very positive because he wants them to keep going. That's why he's written the book. And so chapter after chapter throughout Hebrews, he shows that in Jesus, we have everything from God. That Jesus God's final word, Jesus God's final salvation, and that Jesus will soon bring salvation to those waiting for him. And so if you've got your Bible there, look at chapter 10, verse 36. Uh, Hebrews 10, verse 36. He says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. He urges them to keep going. Why? Because Jesus will return and bring salvation. It's, in, it's imperative. It's vital. It's life and eternal critical that they don't give up on Jesus because Jesus will return. In verse 37, for in just a little while, he who is coming, that is Jesus, will come and will not delay. This is the real, this is the main overarching reason to keep going or even to begin following Jesus because it's the truth, it's a reality. Jesus is going to return. We don't follow Jesus because it's fun or a better lifestyle or it's trendy or it's because it's true and he's going to return. So we need to persevere. But the question is how? How are they to persevere? How are they to push on? How do they keep going in the midst of pain? Well, before I answer that question, let me ask you another question. How does a marathon runner, now I've never run a marathon, um, I know Jonathan has, but how does a marathon runner, when they get to the 40 kilometre mark and their body is reeking with pain and they just want to give up, how do they keep going those last two kilometres? For me, I get to that point about the one kilometre mark. How does a worker, when they've got a big project due and it's just so much work, how do they keep going to get that job done? Or how does a mother in labour keep going after five hours of pain? Why doesn't she sort of give up and say, this child is not worth the pain? What keeps it going? Or how do any of us keep going in anything that's hard? Well, it's the goal, isn't it? It's to think only two kilometres to go or only 10 metres and the next 10 metres. I'll just do the next step in that job project and I'll be there. Or the mother who thinks this pain is nothing compared to the joy the birth of a child brings. It's focusing on the goal that keeps us going. It's thinking about it, meditating, remembering and being reminded of why we're doing this and that it is indeed worth it. And as Jonathan alluded to, that's what we see in chapter 11, verse one. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about we, what we do not see. It's they look to their goal, their hope. And it's the same for us. We're to look to our goal, our hope. This is what it means to live by faith, to trust and believe and to live for what we don't see but what God has promised us. Faith is being confident, being sure of our hope and certain of what we do not see. You see, faith is not the opposite of reason. What lots of people think, oh, if you, if you don't have, you know, faith is sort of like, if, you, if you, it doesn't make sense, then you just believe, or if there's no logic, you've got to have faith. No, no, the opposite of faith is not reason, but it's sight. It's what we don't see yet. So we need faith, trust to to, to believe it, um, that God will do what he's promised. So what are we to be sure and certain of? Well, I want to suggest in the context, it's our hope of heaven. It's the glorious new heaven and new earth that God has planned for us, where there'll be no longer pain or suffering or hardship. Um, God's goal, where everything will be perfect. We're to be sure and confident of this. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. Can I ask you, are you sure and confident that God will fulfill his promises and that Jesus will return 
and take you to be with him? Or I wonder, if you're anything like me, is this something you've forgotten? I think for most of us, we don't think much about Jesus' return. I think we're a bit like this. Imagine, now imagine this is a COVID-free world, so you've got to think back to time before COVID. You win a prize, and that is <clears throat> you've got three weeks, you can travel anywhere in the world, anywhere you like. And it's all paid for. <clears throat> but on top of that, you get $10,000 spending money. Now, the trip's paid for, food, accommodation's all paid for, plus you get this $10,000 just to buy whatever you like. Who would like, just a bit of show of hands, who'd like that prize? Just imagine there's no COVID. It'd be fantastic, wouldn't it? You would spend months thinking about it and planning for it and working out, what, how am I going to make the most of the three weeks and what am I going to spend my money on? Now imagine the day arrives, you get dropped off at Mackay Airport. Now I've never been to Mackay Airport, so I'm just guessing, um, so bear with me. So you go to the airport, you're a couple of hours early because you're so excited and you're sitting around the airport, you get yourself a coffee uh, and then you see someone you know, so you have a bit of chat to them and you're sitting in a nice lounge and you think, I think I might just spend three weeks at Mackay Airport. It's a pretty nice airport. It's got, I can get a coffee whenever I like. It's got toilets. Uh, it's got a nice chair. Forget this trip. I'm just going to stay here for three weeks. Now, not knowing Mackay Airport, but if that was Darwin Airport, it'd be absolutely ridiculous. But I think that's like many of us when, we, when it comes to heaven. You see, we think, this world, our life now, it's like Mackay Airport. We can get so, we get so attached to it, we can forget what our real goal is, and that is life for eternity in heaven. I think also too, for most of us, heaven is in the background. I think heaven's a bit like an insurance policy. You know, we have car insurance, we have house insurance, we've got our eternal insurance. And so we don't really think about it most of the time, just sort of when we might need it. But friends, God doesn't want it to be in the background. He wants it to be in the foreground, in the forefront of our minds, shaping our actions and desires. Something that we're absolutely confident and sure of, that we think about and meditate on proactively. Now, God in his kindness often tends to remind us uh, when we get sick or someone dies or we might get diagnosed with cancer or something that's a reminder I think in God's kindness of this life is passing away and to get us hoping for heaven. One of the Puritans used to spend an hour a day meditating on heaven. I think the other reason we struggle with it is because Australia is such a great place to live. It can be a bit like heaven. And so it can stop us from longing for heaven. So to encourage, how do we keep going then? To encourage them to keep going, the writer of the Hebrews spends a whole chapter, chapter 11, on faith, describing the men and women of faith who kept going. Now, I'm not going to work through it in detail, but I want, to just, I want us to see four things um, from this passage, from chapter 11, and you can read over it and reflect on it later, but I'm just going to mention four principles, if you like, that we learn about faith. The first one is this. Faith trusts God's word and acts accordingly, often despite the circumstances. Faith, faith trusts God's word and acts accordingly, often despite the circumstances. When God told Noah to build an ark, he did it. Even though he was the only guy in town with an ark, Actually, the only guy in the desert, the only guy in this inland town with a boat, he would have looked like an idiot. But he trusted God and obeyed him despite what it looked like. Likewise, when God taught Abraham to leave his land and family, he did it. In fact, when God told geriatric Abraham and Baron Sarah that they're going to have a child, they believed him. And you can read through the other stories. It goes on and on. And it's the same for us. 
for us to follow Jesus, to live his way, it's going to look even weirder today than it did 30 years ago. Uh, you're going to look weird. It's, but we need to trust God like they did, despite the circumstances, even if it looks weird or it's hard or you think, what are you doing, God? So that's the first one. Faith trusts God's word and acts accordingly, often despite the circumstances. The second thing I want to suggest we see here is that faith offers no guarantees in this life. Faith offers no guarantees in this life. You see, in this life, living by faith offers no guarantees, no certainties of a good, happy, pain-free life now. I think that's another thing we learned from this chapter. Let's just look at the first three men of faith and what happened to them. The first man mentioned here is Abel. What happened to Abel? Well, Abel had faith and he died. Do you know the story? He got killed by his brother. So Abel had faith, he died. Who's the second guy? Well, the second guy is Enoch. Verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. So Abel has faith, he dies. Enoch has faith and he doesn't die. Who's the third one? Noah. Well, Noah has faith and everyone else dies. So that pretty much covers every circumstance for the first three people of faith. One has faith and dies. One has faith, doesn't die. And the other has faith and everyone else dies. For some, we see also, their trust in God led to great things in this life. Look at verse 33. He's talking about the men of faith and so on. And he says, this is what happened. Who through faith, they conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised. They shut the mouths of lions. You just think of Daniel. They quenched the fury of the flames, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. They escaped the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. You think of Samson. They became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. So for some of them, faith, trusting in God, led to good things and uh, amazing things in this life. But for others, it was not so good. Have a look at verse 35, the second half. There were others who were tortured refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. You see, some conquered with the sword and some were killed by the sword. Some had the mouths of lions closed Others were eaten by lions. Faith is no guarantee of a good, happy, healthy, prosperous life now. And we need to be aware of those preachers that might say these sort of things explicitly. But we also need to be aware of our own hearts because I think implicitly we can often believe this ourselves. And we know it, it comes out when we, when we suffer and life is hard and we think, God, what are you doing? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't grieve and find it hard, but if we know the truth of the Bible, we'll know we shouldn't be surprised when hard things happen. We can be, we can, it can be hard and painful and awful, and we can cry out to God, but we need to know that faith is no guarantee. Trusting God is no guarantee of a good, happy, healthy, prosperous life now, but not so in the future. Because the third point, so the first one we've seen that, um, that faith trusts God's word and acts according, often despite the circumstances. Secondly, faith offers no guarantees in this life. Thirdly, faith's goal is heaven, is heavenward. Faith's goal is heavenward. Verse 10 about Abram, he says, For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. He was looking forward to heaven. In verse 16, it talks about they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. In verse 26, Moses, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. 
And it's the same for us. We see in verse 39, these, verse 39, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. They too were longing for the future. They were longing for heaven. They were longing for being with Christ, even though they didn't know explicitly uh, Christ was coming. They, they trusted God's promises, which led to Jesus. So faith's goal is heavenward. And finally, fourthly, faith's object is Jesus. I want to mention this because this is important about faith. What's important about faith is not how much faith you have, but it's what your faith is in. Um, let me give you an example. Um, a few years ago, Rachel and I were thinking of sending our two oldest kids to Cairns to visit their grandparents. Um, so we're going to buy them tickets on Qantas, pay the $500, or whatever it is, and send them over to Cairns. Now, Jade, my oldest, he likes money. So I can imagine him saying to me, and he's pretty confident. So I can imagine him saying to me, Dad, can I just have the $500 and put it in my wallet? And I'm going to make an aeroplane to get myself to Cairns. Whereas Toby, there's no way he was going to do that. He was, he was nervous and anxious, but he was going to go on Qantas as we'd arranged. Now imagine that that happens. And so the day arrives, Jaden is in the front yard. He's made this aeroplane out of the stuff in my garage. He's got a little ramp ready to go with 500 bucks in his wallet. Whereas Toby, uh, he gets a lift to the airport. He's nervous, he's anxious, he's worried but he gets on the plane. Who's going to get the cans? Well, it's a no-brainer. Jane's probably not even going to make it up the ramp. Um, Toby's going to get the cans because what matters is not how confident they are or how certain they are, but what it's the, it's the object. It's The aeroplane is reliable. It's going to get Toby to cans, whereas Jane's plane is not. It's not going to get him anywhere. It's not about how much faith you have. It's about what that faith is in. It's all about Jesus. You can have all the faith in the world in Buddha or Allah, or, but you won't be forgiven. You won't be right with God. It's all about Jesus. So the focus of our faith is about Jesus. Okay, so chapter 11 is like an honour board of all God's people that have continued to trust him. And so as we read over it and you can reflect on it again, we've seen four things from that. That faith trusts God's word and acts according, often despite the circumstances. That faith offers no guarantees in this life, but rather faith's goal is heavenward and faith's object is Jesus. With this in mind, the writer then tells them four things that they need to do to keep persevering. And I'll just do this, look at this just very briefly. And I think here we're seeing like a picture of a, a runner. You can easily imagine uh, a, a marathon runner. Um, and that's what we're seeing in verses, uh, one, in chapter 12, verse one to, one, one to three. And so you can picture it. There's a great crowd. We see in verse one, this great crowd, the marathon runner is running. And he says four things. Firstly, he says, as you run this race, this Christian race, throw off everything that hinders. Now, I wasn't there, but when Jonathan ran the marathon, I reckon he didn't have a jumper on. He probably didn't have tracksuit pants. He wouldn't have had a backpack on. He would have had the bare minimal because when you're running a race, you don't want a lot of stuff on. Um, and so here he's saying, throw off everything that hinders. Now here, I think the stuff he's talking about here, um, the hindering things, they're not sin but they can hinder our focus on heaven, our devotion to Jesus. I think for me, you know, technology is one of those things. We can get so caught up in, it can waste so much time. And uh, it's one of those things, it's not bad in and of itself, but it can, it, can, it, can, it can hinder our race. So we need to throw that off. But also, secondly, we need to throw off the sin that entangles. Imagine trying to run a race with rope tied around your ankles. Uh, sin just trips us up. Sin uh, is not going to, if we're sinning, that's not going to help us run towards Jesus and to long for heaven. In some ways, it's like running the other way. 
it's not going to keep our focus on heaven and and on jesus so he's saying throw that off as well so get rid of the things that hinder the things that aren't sin but they can hinder us and certainly get rid of get rid of sin that can definitely trip us up and not help and then positively he says run with perseverance keep going and fourthly, so throw up everything hinders, throw off the sin that entangles, secondly. Thirdly, run with perseverance. And fourthly, fix your eyes on Jesus. In verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Why do we fix our eyes on Jesus? What's he saying here? Well, it's not because we're to follow his example. We don't fix our eyes on Jesus here to follow his example and to be like Jesus here, that's not why he's telling us to focus on Jesus. That's not his point here. We focus on Jesus, he says, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. In other words, we look to Jesus because he's done it for us. That's what we're to focus on. We're to look to Jesus because he's, he's completed it. He's provided forgiveness and salvation and eternal life for us. So as we look to Jesus, we're reminded that he's done it for us, that we're forgiven only because of Jesus. And we can remember again, it's all about him and it's not about us. And that's what helps us to keep going, to keep persevering because Jesus has been there and done it for us. Let me finish by reading these verses for us as a challenge for you and for me, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. Because in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. Let me pray for us that God will help us with this. Father God, thank you that you speak. Thank you that you know that it's hard that life is a challenge. I know Paul in Colossians prays for all your power to keep persevering because it's hard. I pray for us that you might help us to keep persevering, that you might help us to keep uh, focusing on Jesus to keep rejoicing in that Jesus has perfected the faith for us so that we can live in it. So help us then to throw off everything that hinders, all those things that you know and we know that don't help us in our walk with you. Help us to get rid of that sin that trips us up that really does stop us from focusing on Jesus. Help us to keep going and help us to keep looking to you and to long for that day when you return and to keep reflecting on that and on heaven. Help us in this, we pray, to keep going by your Spirit's power. Amen.